This is the home of commerce and industry. It is the birthplace of fad and fashion. A kaleidoscope of life in the fast lane. This is England. This is also England. History and heritage, the ancient land of knights and kings, poets and saints. Here the mists of legend flow powerfully into the present. This green and pleasant land is a fertile ground for the creative spirit. Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth. This is where man's first factories grew into an industrial revolution, where the clatter of horses' hooves on cobblestones gave way to the metallic roar of traffic. Today's traveler, careening through canyons of concrete and steel, with connections defined in minutes, can find an oasis in our 20th century, just across a crowded street, behind a building, beneath a bridge. Always within reach of modern man's whirlwind life are tranquil vestiges of a long ago yesterday. Over 200 years, a second England has lain secluded within the very heart of Great Britain. This is the world of the inland waterways, one of the oldest and most extensive canal systems in the world. Every person in the Western world owes something to it, for the English canals helped to make possible the Industrial Revolution, without which our modern world would be unrecognizable. Indeed, all of modern industry and technology has its roots in the heart of the English Midlands, whose arteries are her rivers and canals. Although they now often lie just a few feet away from freeways and modern office buildings, they are rarely seen by the casual traveler. Even to the people living nearby, their history is as mysterious as the early morning mists that shroud them. For the average person living in early 18th century Britain, life was much as it had been for centuries. His world was one of medieval isolation. The local village had to provide all of life's needs. However, history is always a story of change. In 1709, coke, a product of coal, was first used to smelt iron ore in the Midlands. The textile industry began a series of dramatic improvements. Entrepreneurs like Josiah Wedgwood were making strides in the development of pottery and other domestic products. But the inland transportation of raw materials and finished goods invariably involved the hazards of crude, unpaved roads. At best, it was inefficient and risky. By the middle of the 18th century, the essential elements for industrial revolution were in place. Only an efficient transportation system was needed to begin a process that would change the world. Although boats avoided the problems of the early roads, Britain's rivers were navigable only partway inland. Canals could provide the ideal transportation between the factory and the marketplace, and it was the pound lock that made this possible, enabling a canal to cross hills and valleys. An excellent example which can be seen today is the flight of Hatton Locks. It lowers the Grand Union Canal 146 feet to Warwick. The Pound Lock is a simple system that remains essentially the same today. A boat enters a lock chamber and the gates are closed behind it. Valves called paddles are opened either to fill or empty the chamber. thus bringing the boat to the next level of the canal. Gates on the other end of the lock are then opened for the boat to exit. Canal technology was the catalyst. 
the Duke of Bridgewater was the man. As the owner of coal mines near Manchester, he saw great potential in lowering his transportation costs through an inland waterway system. His first canal began operation at these mines in 1761. By dramatically reducing transportation costs, this canal cut the price of coal in Manchester by one half. This success caught the imagination of the public and opened what became known as the Canal Age. James Brindley, engineer of the Bridgewater Canal, went on to link the Midlands with several of England's major rivers. Early construction was simple and unencumbered, following the contours of the land. This resulted in a meandering route. Later engineers constructed more direct routes. These were more expensive, but more efficient canals. Thomas Telford, the most prominent of the later engineers, began his canal engineering work at the height of canal construction. He introduced a new sophistication and elegance to canal architecture. This aqueduct in Wales is an excellent example of the new technological daring of his day. These works stand today as evidence of their optimism and engineering skill. In 1804, Thomas Telford had begun work on the Caledonian Canal in Scotland. This canal enabled seagoing vessels to navigate across the width of Scotland. Although never an economic success, for the first time it demonstrated the practicality of constructing a seaway across a landmass. Canal projects required authorization from Parliament, but the companies were privately owned and operated. By the end of the 18th century, a canal mania had captured the imagination of the British people. Every community saw the advantages of a canal. Fortunes were being made, and speculation in still more projects flourished. Everyone wanted a piece of the action. Canal construction transformed the countryside. In the 1790s, about 50,000 workers were involved, extending the canal navigation throughout the country. These laborers became known as navvies. With picks, shovels, and horse-drawn carts, they forever changed the British landscape. By 1850, the canal system had reached its greatest extent, over 3,500 miles. By painfully slow methods, tunnels were bored to lengths of over three miles. Some tunnels were too narrow to include a towpath. Men had to lie on their backs and leg the boats through by walking on the walls. I've heard my father say that he used to be a legger through the tunnel, and they legged them through with a feet, you see, through the laying on the backs and just walking through the uh, tunnel. This is a standard English canal narrowboat. It is a bit over 71 feet long and 7 feet wide. There were various types of canal boats in this country. Um, the earliest ones, of course, were all wood, because wood was the only material available. Later on, there were iron composite ones, that is, iron with wooden bottoms, and later on, all iron ones. The sides are oak, built onto iron frames. Some of them were built onto wooden frames, or knees, as they're called. A plank such as we got on the fore end there, you've got about 20 minutes or half an hour to get it round to the shape you want it and actually fastened up. These boats were built to fit locks 7 feet 2 inches wide and 72 feet long. These narrow boats were originally pulled by horses on a towpath beside the canal. Diesel engines eventually replaced the horse. Within 19th century English society, a unique subculture developed around the canals. The crew was usually an entire family. They lived on board and raised their children to be the next crew. Because running a pair of boats is not a one-man job, it's, uh, it's a family job. There's nearly always a man and his wife in the family. They lived entirely on the boats. They were born on the boats and died on the boats, most of them. Now, you can make this cabin a most comfortable place because it, it's so close. There's everything to your hand. Almost square, you know, seven to eight foot long and seven foot wide. Lived in those 
cramped quarters. How they used to do it, I don't know. I have 21 children. They were all born on the canal. I was born 54 years ago on a canal boat at Cowlane Wharf, Chester. Most of the canal children went through without any education at all. Usually, of course, when the children began to get older, they would they'd take a, a boat or a couple of boats of their own, and then they would follow father and mother and see make a kind of a family affair of it. There wasn't very much courting attached to it, apart from asking how well you were an elf when you passed each other on the way. And you were lucky if you uh, met up with, it, with each other at a discharging point where you unloaded and loaded your boat again. Keep your hands off, that's mine. You just be careful what you do. That little bit of fancy work, it doesn't belong to you. But she's a nice girl. I know, and she squeezes absolutely fine. You can do just what you like with any of the fellas, wife, but keep your hands off, that's mine. They was real smart with their corduroy trousers, with the bell bottoms and the velvet seams and the diamond stitching, the white cotton unmade shirt with the feather red stitching all down the front. And then, of course, the women, they always wore an apron and then with a fabulous sort of a bonnet. It come right down with a shoulder piece, more like a cape. When the number ones had their boats, they used to go and get their boat painted up better than to beat the other fella. Just the same with the old traditional rope work, you see. And then later on, that fella, he'd say to his wife, Oh, good gracious, Sarah, we mustn't let him get away with that, you know. They would see who could get the best turnout of brasses and crochet ear caps. Even the nose tins that they used to carry to feed the horse would be painted in the old traditional style with the roses and diamonds all around and a brass buckle polished up all to match the harness. The first canals were built in the Manchester area. On right about Manchester, there was a lot of gypsies. The Caribbean lived in caravans. They was traditionally decorated with roses and castles. The gypsies worked the boats, being used to the travelling life, sort of a no man life, you know. And uh, also they transferred their painting to the boats. It's very stylized. You've got different styles in different boat yards. Some people just paint. Uh, one petal formation for, for all the roses, you know, like one big petal or and two this way, uh, or whatever. The easier it looks, the more stylized it is, and the more reason there is, because it was sort of maximum effect for minimum effort. canals we find we live with nature and nature lives with us and we love it despite some changes the narrow boats and life on the canals remained much as they had been for more than a century from 1790 to 1840 the canals were the primary transportation system for Britain's industry these were the first crucial decades of the Industrial Revolution In 1830, George Stevenson had demonstrated the superior speed and efficiency of rail transportation. During the next 20 years, 6,600 miles of track were laid in Britain, and the railroad began to dominate. 1865 was the first year of actual decline in freight carried on the canals. By 1900, it was clear that narrowboat transportation would not keep pace with 20th century industry. The fact that they were built narrow in the first place really was one of the nails in the coffin that finally brought about the demise of commercial carrying because it was impossible to carry a commercial load. Um, the most they could ever carry was 
something like 25, 27 tonnes. And as the canal silted up anyway, it became impossible to carry even that much. And today, you'd be lucky to carry 12 or 15 tonnes on the same boat because you'd be on the bottom all the time. They say canals are finished now, they want the cup to die. It's more than any man can tell to know the reason why. And while they take our homes from us, our working boats and loads, six thousand corpses every year lie bleeding on the road. The paddle gear is hard to draw, they let the lock gates leak. The pounds are filling up with mud and getting worse each week. The dredging boats and piling gangs but work in bits and parts. Our brasses and our painted boats do hide our breaking hearts. Today there is a renaissance of activity on the canals. For thousands of people each year, they are a unique link with the past. The canals have become a living museum of natural history and our industrial heritage. In 1948, most of the canals were nationalized. Today, the waterways are maintained by the British Waterways Board. In some areas, derelict canals are being restored by independent groups of canal enthusiasts. Although commercial traffic has almost entirely disappeared from the narrow canals, many of the traditions of canal life still remain. Today's narrow boats follow the original designs of a century ago but are fully equipped with modern conveniences. Hot and cold running water, showers, and complete kitchens. Many of these houseboats are rented by vacationers on a weekly basis. They can be driven anywhere on the inland waterways. Another tradition still maintained today is the leisurely pace of life which has always been a part of the canals. Boats travel through the countryside at a walking speed. There is ample time to stroll through villages and stop at canal-side pubs. A personal sense of discovery awaits around each bend. For the Duke of Bridgewater, the canals were a daring business venture. They now provide a quiet spectacle of the unexpected. A peaceful afternoon for fishing, even during the busiest workday. A sense of rural isolation just outside a bustling city center. Cruising on a modern canal boat offers a unique waterborne viewpoint of a relatively unknown second England. You see more from a canal than from the road. Local people can help you tremendously by pointing out where these little spots mm -hmm. hide themselves. The canals penetrate the very heart of England. For today's traveler, they are a living, working monument to a bygone age of wonder and invention. A time before cars and trains when nothing ran faster than a horse.
Johnson's Pottery Works had a, a factory in Milton. They also had a factory in Hanley. After many years, they suddenly realised that they'd got this facility of using the canal to link the two factories. A trip on the canals will go through cities along routes established nearly two centuries ago. Following these original trade routes laid out by Brindley, Telford, and other civil engineers of their time is to retrace the paths of our recent history. To see those first connections between factory and mine, field and market. Even the early machinery can still be experienced. It may not always be cooperative, but these minor challenges are all a part of the adventure. From a narrow boat, you can see England the way it should be seen uh, at a walking pace. The areas along the canals are rich with England's history you don't uh, miss the fine points as you go by. The pastoral smells and sounds. I like to see the dew rising off the fields early in the morning and I particularly enjoy hearing the church bells. We picked a lot of blackberries and wild raspberries. One morning we were able to find some mushrooms growing in the field and we sliced them up and had them for breakfast. And it was rather nice too to be able to get goat's milk and, and fresh eggs from the neighboring farms along the side of the canal. It's fascinating to see the, uh, the old factories lining the canals and realize that these are the remnants of the very first industries ever and yet be cruising alongside them in a boat with all the modern conveniences. I recall some of the most beautiful evenings when we would moor our boat for the night and before the sun went down. The setting in total was was so awakening to our senses. With every little turn that we would make in that canal we would be constantly surprised by the variety of animal life that existed along the banks of the water. Ah yes, the animals. On the canals, evidence of Britain's rich history abounds. From iron bridge corners deeply rutted by the tow ropes of horse-drawn boats, to Holy Trinity Church in Stratford, where Shakespeare lies. Oxford, where the canal system joins the River Thames. Warwick Castle, where through the centuries the Earls of Warwick wielded their tremendous power over the British realm. In Scotland, there is more to Loch Ness than its traditional image of mystery and isolation. It is part of the Caledonian Canal, which interconnects several freshwater lakes. Cutting through the beautiful Great Glen of Scotland, this was Thomas Telford's massive project designed to give ships an alternative to the treacherous waters of the North Sea. However, it took almost 50 years to complete, and by then, most ships were too large for the locks. Today, smaller seagoing vessels share the locks with holidaymakers.
In the rush of today, it is still possible to experience much of Britain from the deck of a boat. On the canals, there is a special kind of romance where the past lives within the present. It is a unique adventure in our frantically paced lives, not only to visit, but to live for a time in the world of a century ago. In this, a most civilized adventure, there is time for everything, and on the canals, time has always been measured in centuries.